Great. So um, my name is Allison Hurrier, and I am the head of the textile art curriculum in the School of Art and Design at Portland State University. Uh, the textile art curriculum is an elective track in the art practice program that was launched in 2019 that provides a critical investigation of clothing and textiles in relationship to craft, material culture, identity, global history, community practice, and sustainability. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewn construction, and the history of dress that allow students to develop portfolios for a variety of applications in textiles, apparel, costume, and contemporary art. We are so thrilled today to be collaborating with Portland Textile Month. Um, for the folks joining us from the PSU community, Portland Textile Month is an amazing volunteer organization created to engage the local textile community for a month long festival of events centered around knowledge sharing and cross pollination between enthusiasts, artists, businesses, and institutions. The organization has initiated over 50 events this month around the theme of repair and reuse. And we are so excited about incorporating this theme into our curriculum this fall. Um, I would like to thank um, Caleb Cyan for his vision and spearheading Portland Textile Month and Eli West for all of his assistance in coordinating the PSU sponsored events. Um, I'd also um, just like to share that I did add a link to Portland Textile Month in the chat in case you would like to um, have some more information about the events and how to get involved. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be turning things over to my esteemed colleague, Annan Barrett, who's teaching the History of Dress course um, that's sponsoring this event. However, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Portland State University rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. River. Uh, we thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. Um, in remembering these communities, we honor the legacy, the lives, and their descent, their lives and their descendants. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will uh, join you all again uh, after um, after um, Andrea's talk for the question and answer session. Um, in the meantime, please feel to type any questions and comments that you have uh, in the Q and A forum um, that's available at the bottom of your screen, and we'll make sure to address them after the talk. Um, and with that, Annan, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it from here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. I've been looking forward to this talk for quite a while. Um, really pleased to introduce Andrea Arano. She has a storied career as a fashion designer in New York. She's been a textile researcher in Peru, China, and Japan. And she's a collector of extraordinary textiles for places like the British Museum during her worldwide travels. She's the co-founder of Textile High, the 40,000 piece fabric collection archived here in Portland, a frequent lecturer on textile traditions and a fashion industry insider. Her deep knowledge and evident love of textiles comes through in her unique voice, informed by decades of study and lived experience among textile makers around the world. We're in for a treat, a talk about how textiles and motifs evolve with a special look at some gorgeous Japanese textiles from Andrea's collection. So I'll let you get started and tell us about what you have to show. Hello from New York, this is Andrea speaking and I'm gonna focus on the reuse of design in textiles, the reuse and the refinement of designs as I've observed over my 59 years of looking at textiles. Last year I was mingling out there in Portland for Portland Textile Month. So I'm grateful for this kind of invitation to return and reach you remotely. I'm a textile gypsy by profession. So a long spell here in New York City with my personal textile library and actual textiles have given me a lot of time to reflect. My studies of textiles began haphazardly, propelled by curiosity about different cultures and an attraction to spending time with the people generating them. My anthropology friend calls this heavy hanging out. And yes, I did. I spent five years hanging out in Peru. 
and I've never studied textiles. I did a bachelor's degree in history and leapt in with both hands open and both eyes wide. Following a childhood practice with fabrics and the cut and sew, I first looked closely at the fabrics themselves during the five years in Peru. The ladies there started with shearing their own sheep, preparing the wool, spinning it, and finally weaving it. The time factor there wasn't counted. They were doing other tasks, turning the sheep, taking care of the children, cooking. So this was ongoing and they were very slow to make their pieces. But the motifs were very carefully considered. This is a fellow making a carrying cloth on a backstrap loom. Over the past 50 years, things have changed. The dyes changed, fewer natural dyes, more aniline. Sometimes the hand sheeps, the hand spun sheep's wool was updated with a commercial yarn, but the long tradition of using a backstrap loom endured. Other aspects were observed. This is a very old manta, old being maybe 1930s from my collection. This is worn pinned around the shoulders and that beautiful deep purple is most certainly cochineal. So the format is in place. They're tapestry woven bands of geometrics. Later, things changed and the bands got more complex. So this one, as you can see, is dated from 1955 and it also has the name of the uh, future owner woven into one of the tapestry bands. And then the most recent, because I was there in the 1970s, things developed even farther. These bright acrylic yarns were introduced along with pictures. This is a very, very fancy one, certainly done on commission that shows the whole band playing and people dancing. And as you can see, there's now a modern suburban house and a car been added as well as the brand name, the Casa Malpica and the location and the date. But in other parts of the weaving in this area, traditional geometric motifs continued. This close up is of a very narrow, narrow band, just about a half inch wide, a gaiter that's tied around one leg of the pants at the bottom. And the dyes are natural. We also had in Peru in the 70s, some use or reuse of designs from Inca textiles. These had been published and they were probably available in books, but this is a brand new floor covering that was woven, tapestry loom, but old Incan motifs. After five years in Peru, I moved on to England for a few years. That's when I cataloged my whole big collection and the British Museum bought 400 pieces. And uh, I was there with libraries, museum collections and I started taking my first trips out to Asia while my kids stayed studying in London. We were in a big hurry because the school vacations were short. And after a couple of trips to Asia, I decided that these six week trips weren't really going to advance me very far to understanding Chinese minority textiles. So we took off a whole year and very slowly planted ourselves in distinct communities of minority makers in China. This is just one of the people we visited in Guizhou, one of the communities. And this is the very typical and traditional costume. 
So you can see that a key component is the apron, which he wears over the front. Let's move one more ahead. So in this region, the format of the design was reused over and over. And you can see it here in different examples. Three columns left and right with some sort of a grid concocted in the center. In the upper photo, you can see a detail of this counted thread embroidery. It's absolutely immaculate. So the givens were the red color on a dark indigo ground in the columns on each side. But each lady produced a variation. So she's reusing the format, but innovating in the specifics. The long stay I did after Japan was three years, sorry, after China was three years in Japan in the mid 80s. And there I was working in a whole different type of society. The people in Peru, as well as these communities on the perimeters of China, had very isolated lives. But in Japan, things by the time I got there in the 80s were far different. First of all, it was a society that had been literate, fully literate, or nearly fully literate for over 100 years. There was a lot more communication around the different parts of Japan. And also the political system of having people from the provinces, leaders from the provincial governments spending six months at home with their people and the following six months with the emperor in the capital led to both textiles themselves and motifs and all the arts being fairly well known all over the country. So it wasn't so much specific to the place. And then the other thing that was became evident as I was learning about the history was that contrary to the widely quoted notion that Japan was closed prior to Commodore Petty, Perry in 1853, ships had been hitting the coasts of Japan for centuries and luxury foreign textiles were acquired, particularly by the uh, religious temples and shown off and yeah, Japanese developed an appetite for these very expensive exquisite goods. So of course they were geared to reuse the motifs. What I'm showing you here are some block printed scraps of cloth from India. This is known as a, in Japan as a style called sarasa. And not only from India, but foreign goods came in from Indonesia quite early as part of the international trade. So this is a sarasa and this came to be used and highly regarded for tea ceremony equipment in Japan. So even these small pieces had a big uh, effect. Now, when I was there studying, collecting and learning, I had a chance to buy a whole archive of original textile paintings. And in one group executed after the war, probably in the early fifties, I found these designs such as this, which are actually labeled sarasa on the back. So they've taken this foreign style mixture of foreign elements and they've adapted it to this kind of pattern, which would be used for kimono cloth. The kimono cloth is always about 13 inches wide as are these life-size paintings. We'll look at a few more. So this series, as you can see, does a lot of reuse and imitation. They're the tiny dots that refer to the shibori technique. The flowers are painted as though they've been embroidered with single threads. And I was able to buy 
at one point a kimono made out of sample sarasa patterns. So this is what it looks like. When they designed kimono cloth by the 20th century, by the early, very early part of the 20th century, textile design in Japan had changed from something that was done by an artist who would sign his pieces and it could either be a design for kimono cloth or for ceramics or a hanging scroll. By the early 20th century, there were textile design studios in the sense that they had developed in Europe. One studio, anonymous designers, and they usually produced a series of designs that would then be sent out to the retailer so the client could choose which pattern she wanted and then it would be ordered and the cloth would be produced and someone would sew it, very many steps. But this gives you, because someone took these sample kimono lengths and stitched it into an under kimono called the Nagajuban, you can see the range of patterns that went into this particular offering. And this is a haori, which is the top jacket-like piece of a kimono outfit from the same period. The background has changed, but the motifs are familiar. So that's Sarasa. Carrying on a little bit further with reuse in Japan, we have some motifs that appear again and again. So uh, this one will surely look familiar. These are cherry blossoms, the white ones, and the others are dotted with fake shibori patterns as well as the stems. It's a common motif. Bamboo, the painting on the left. This is an extremely beautiful painting, but the format and the angularity are familiar. On the right, a watercolor featuring the momoji, which is uh, maple leaves. Quite evocative of the fall season for Japanese. The pine tree is also a stand-in for longevity. So I'm showing you a few different renditions of the way the pine has been um, shown. Uh, the one on the left is quite old, probably uh, late 1900s. And the one on the right is quite modern, post-war. And I think there are a few more here. Yeah, this is another rendition of pine needles. So all these symbols that have been used continue to be reused and refined for kimonos over the whole period. These are a few more cherry blossom themes from different times. The one on the left is interesting. For the longest time, I was wondering Wow, this is very exquisite and pretty and delicate, but then there are these heavy blotches of black. What are they for? Finally, like years later, someone explained to me that they represent areas which would be embroidered with heavy thread. So this kimono would have the ground fabric painted with this very delicate thing, but the heavier black parts would be re-embroidered, adding another layer of luxury to the garment. Here we have more cherry blossoms. This is part of a very early and very elegant series of hand-painted designs. This group was executed in ink on washi paper probably around 1900. And a design that to us in the West seems very modern and streamlined was devised from these traditional symbols, the cherry blossom and the chrysanthemum and very beautifully executed. 
Another technique was developed during the first half of the last century, which is called Mason. Mason looks like this. It almost seems like an ecot because the yarns are space dyed before being woven. They don't line up quite perfectly. So they have little bits of fuzziness along the edges. And the way this was created is fascinating. Uh, it actually was a new product who was birthed around the end of the last century. And it was instrumental in changing the use of kimono in Japan during that time. Here you can see a design of bamboo leaves and snowflakes, and you see some shaded areas, which is where the threads are not quite lined up. In this case, it looks like it's the weft threads, the horizontal threads that have been space dyed, and they're not quite lined up when they're woven. This was of great interest in two ways. Uh, the technique itself was supposedly um, stolen from France when some, or reused from France, when some Japanese industrial spies spent time looking at the way Chine was created in France. Rather than binding and unbinding the threads to reserve the area to stay white, the threads were laid out very, very evenly and then stenciled. So this allowed one stencil for each color, multicolored patterns to be created quite quickly. The other aspect of Mason that made it popular was it was made from very short fiber, a part of the cocoon that had previously been tossed away as not being strong enough. So kimonos and haoris fashioned in the Mason technique were much, much cheaper and spurred the new development in thinking that you didn't have to buy a kimono for a lifetime to be passed down to your daughter and your granddaughters and so on. You could buy a kimono spur of the moment, trend in style, follow what the new department stores were saying was the latest wrinkle. I brought this to show you because this is what things look like in the 1930s. You see the giant poster that was commissioned for a department store window on the left. And this is really spoke to the people because on the left is the lady with the traditional hairstyle, traditionally tied obi. But her companion wearing the yellow kimono is what was called a modern girl. So she has her hair in a bob and her accessories a li little more loose. Then again, on the right, you see uh, another commissioned piece from this 30s era, which clearly acknowledges the trend coming from Art Deco in Europe. So things were lively in Japan. This period is called the Taisho period of the 20s and 30s. And there was a lot of exchange and a lot of experimentation. Now let's look at another technique that was used. Here's another Mason piece. This is from uh, the post-war. This is a Howry, an over jacket, which is from the 1960s. And again, you see a reflection of what was happening in international art, op art had made its way into kimono cloth as well as other places. Another very dynamic 60s howry. And sometimes they were more pictorial. So this one imitates um, toys and also the color is very vibrant. These Smashing colors of the 60s were pretty significant in the range of color 
for Japanese women of the 20th century didn't often get this strong. So I did some reuse myself of the kimono designs and I want to encourage you to when you're looking for designs and you're thinking about how to use them don't think too narrowly. In this photo shoot we uh, projected a mason textile design onto a model wearing an all white kimono. So the design the fabric length, which I collected, looked like this. And when it was projected onto her white kimono, it looked like this. And when it was projected onto her neck and face, it looked like this. So this information, this reuse of design is just a starting point for you as you think about it, it doesn't have to be used flat, it doesn't have to be used the same scale. Um, it can flow and grow with you. Another technique which had a lot of play is katazome, which is patterning the cloth by using a stencil. The stencil could be cut like this. Um, it's made on a special paper soaked with persimmon juice, which adds a lot of strength. I took a visit to see Katazome down in Naha in Okinawa and visited this studio. This is what their products look like. Being Okinawa, being in the far south, close to Taiwan, the colors from their culture were much brighter than those traditionally used in mainland Japan. This fellow is cutting a stencil on the left and on the right you see the yardage which has been partially dyed. So each color represents a different stencil and the design grows as they work their way down the whole kimono length. Here's the design on top of a partially colored cloth. Here are some of the tools they use. Um, the pots are for mixing the resist. So they pass the resist through the stencil and that keeps the dye from entering those places. That's the basic way stenciling is done, one color at a time. Another technique, which is a very old one in Japan, is yuzen, where the whole cloth is hand painted. And nowadays it's used for the more formal kimonos, like this one pictured here, with a family crest, two on the front and three across the back. These could be used for weddings or New Year's. Nowadays in Japan, in the 21st century, very few women wear kimono on a daily basis, but most women still keep these formal kimono available. And yeah, you can see there's a lot of time put into this. If you can see clearly, there's a tiny white line separating these color areas. So that line is transferred onto the naked white cloth as a resist to tell the painter where to stop her color or his color as the case may be. But all the colors are mixed by hand and applied with tiny brushes to fill in the pattern. This is a pattern from uh, my archive of original paintings which I think is pretty wonderful and dynamic. A painting like this would be used as a placement print, not a repeating pattern. So you'd have something like this, a version of it on each of the kimono fronts. Uh, lately, meaning uh, the last hundred years, most of the pattern of the formal kimonos is hanging around the hem 
For one thing, you have a wide OB that would break up the design where it carried upwards. So there may be a light pattern across the shoulders, but the heaviest part of the pattern is at the bottom. Here's a sketch, original sketch. And yeah, this is, we're now in a studio where they're hand painting using, and you see what the finished layout would look like on the Howery. And you see the original drawing below that. These are hand drawn. And one of the reasons why textile paintings were kept for so long in Japan in these craft studios is because the designs would be reused. They would be refreshed. They might paste on a different element or change the colors, but they kept these preciously and reworked the designs, particularly during historic periods when Japan was trying to build uh, its unity uh, and uh, looking for nostalgia to bring everyone together to support, for example, during their expansionist period in the 30s. This fellow is painting, hand painting the Yuzen. So you can see the white areas that have been reserved and you can see that the background color has been brushed on this beautiful blue, probably with a wide brush. Do you see how he holds the cloth taut with the bamboo sticks that hold out the diagonal corner so he gets an absolutely flat surface to paint on? And then you see how carefully he has to mix his colors before applying them. This is another under kimono, quite an old one, probably from the late Meiji period, maybe the 1890s. But again, it is made from samples of different styles of using, very, very delicately painted. Okay. Kasuri is getting to be a familiar word in America, but just to remind you, its other name is ikat. And we're seeing lots of blue and white ikat these days. In Japan, it was often used for farm clothes because ikat actually necessitates separating groups of thread and binding them dipping them in the dye many, many times to get the dark shade of indigo required, then unwrapping them and then finally weaving them. This is quite a long process and it's usually just done with one or two colors. Mason, because of the ease of switching out stencils can be much more colorful. But this was everyday farm clothing up in the very north of Honshu. I visited a museum and learned a little bit more. It's rice country with very long and snowy winters. And as the women were inside for so month, many months, they learned to do wonderful things with the rice straw. Here is another Kasuri farmer's jacket. This has both warp and weft uh, prepared. So as you may be able to see the fainter geometric motif that looks like a flying something is executed just with the weft threads being colored. But where it goes very white, it's because both weft and warp threads are white in those areas. This is another 1960s garment, which I love. Um, you can see pretty well in the piece on the right, how the warp kasuri just has those few, few threads black punctuating the rest of the design. And this is another beautiful, delicate kasuri. Both warp and weft have been designed. Someone asked me about Amami Oshima. This is a very special style that was developed in the islands between 
Kyushu in Okinawa, which traditionally uses this wonderful mud dye. Both warp and weft are dyed prior to weaving. It was a very precious commodity. Many people tried to imitate its look. Here you have a print, which you can see in detail on the right, of something trying to imitate the Oshima look, but far less costly. And even prints like this. So it developed the reuse of the look of the uh, Amami Oshima went forward by its designers. Here's a group of pieces, very exquisite, beautiful color of the mud dye and their treasures. These are two very fine examples of e cotton, not on silk this time or cotton, like the indigo pieces I showed you, but these are on a very fine bast cloth. And it's called jofu. The motifs are tiny, like small insects. And there again is very prestigious. Jofu is an ideal fabric for the steamy summers of Japan. So these garments were very costly when they were first made. And more kasuri. All right, next up is shibori, which is called tie-dye by some Americans. And let's take a look. It's a resist dye where a fabric already woven is bound and the rest of the cloth is dipped in dye, gray, This, in this case. When the threads are unwrapped from all these tiny little bunches, it leaves them white. And in Japan, they like the texture too. So they set it with heat. This is from the end of a soft man's obi. Again, two different scales, two kinds of shibori technique on a pat patterned satin ground. It can be spaced out. It can be executed on a flat ground or a textured weave as we see here. Shibori had many incarnations and continues to be developed. A child's garment, huge pattern for a small child, quite a dramatic effect. When I left Japan, I came back to New York City. That was 1987 and I'd been away about 15 years. And I realized so many people were liking these Japanese swatches. They didn't want to buy kimono or they didn't want to buy historic clothing. They wanted a small swatch to inspire new designs, to reuse the pattern. So I opened a business called Andrea Aronel Textile Documents. And here it was, me showing a batik to a client who had already pulled out a few designs she wanted to buy. This was a fun time for me. I had lots and lots and lots of swatches, not just Japanese material, but things that I'd gathered on my own. I made more trips. I learned something about traditional industrial textiles and antique textiles. And I love working with clients, but it was a heavy business. We did design fairs in New York and Paris a few times a year. Then I also carried around and visited clients with my suitcases back in the day when I was stronger. And um, this is at a trade fair in Paris. Each time we'd pick out things that we thought worked well with contemporary trends and hang them on the walls and people come by the booth and pick out what they wanted. After 25 years of doing this, I decided that was probably long enough and I should get back to more textile research. And that's when this whole collection of artwork and textile swatches moved out to Portland. And with my son, Caleb Cyan, a new company was born called Textile Hive. This is the showroom of Textile Hive in Portland. 
um, it's not that crowded every day, but I guess that was a good evening. Um, members of Textile Hive are invited in to handle the textiles, which adds a wonderful dimension. But the basis of Textile Hive is that all these 40,000 textiles were photographed and they were all cataloged and they're now in the cloud so that members, including students of schools who subscribe, can do very detailed searches and find out what they're, where they leave. They can search by geography, they can search by technique, they can search by motif. There are 2,300 search words, hierarchical searches. And uh, it's quite a modern way. It's the way to reuse textile designs of this time and place. That's again a shot at the showroom of Textile Hive. And you can get up close, you can touch them. I like the tactile quality of textiles and we offer it especially to people visiting Portland. This is what the Textile Hive website could look like when you're doing a search. This is a search for banana, sorry, banana, bandana, banana. <laughs> and um, you see there are a lot of terms you can apply. And this is what this search brought up in this particular instance. The client or student being you can build a personal collection on the left. You can see lots of words here because Caleb spent years developing this wonderful app. And uh, here's a collection of conversationals. Uh, there are many ideas available. Another type of search. So it includes traditional textiles, old industrial textiles, artwork, um, it can be quite specific as you build. And the scans on the website are good, or the photographs, I should say. You can see weaving techniques as well. It's not just surface pattern that we show here. Some shibori or other bright examples from Japan. About one fifth of textile hive consists of fabrics and sketches from Japan. So that's 20%. But the range is huge. There are 50 countries covered in this collection. If you want inspiration from Madagascar or Southern Spain, you can look on the map and just point. So that's me and Caleb at a triumphant moment when we'd reached some new stage. Please mark down the contacts. We'd love to hear from you with questions and opinions and suggestions. You have our Instagrams listed, uh, my Facebook. I'm continuing from New York to do research and beginning to let loose my private collection, which is here in New York. 40,000 pieces in Portland did not empty the coffers. So hope to hear some questions from you and um, very nice to join you. Thank you for the invite. Thank you so much, Andrea. This is this was just incredible. I think seeing like um, just all the different techniques that um, that that are used and the different ways that they are sort of reused over time, um, and then how designers are starting to think about them. 
um, as inspiration. Um, and I think I really appreciated too just the um, the overview of the the collection that you all have at, at Textile Hive. Um, for the students that are watching today, I think that this is just a really unique and exciting resource that we have like right here in Portland. And so um, I did share the link for Textile Hive in our chat. And um, there's um, some information about um, student memberships and things um, that are that are available on that link. Um, so questions are starting to sort of populate the um, the uh, chat session here. Um, the first one that we have is um, is actually a technical question from an anonymous attendee um, who who was just asking for the clarification on how to spell uh, or the spelling of the Sarasa technique. It's spelled S-A-R-A-S-A. -A -A. And what it really represents in everyday Japanese today are these designs that originated in India or Indonesia or a foreign place, but have been kind of adopted into the Japanese style lexicon. Great. Were they primarily um, used for tea ceremonies? Is another question from Jody Stegman. Yeah, the original pieces that were imported are revered and used for tea ceremonies. But the style sarasa, as you saw from the paintings I showed you from the 1950s, the style continues to evolving. But the real sarasa fragments are used by tea ceremony collectors. They're precious. Thank you for that. Um, Susan Hopkins is asking, is Textile Hive interested in bequests of other collections? Um, I think well, Textile Hive has enough at the moment. <laughs> but of course we're interested, but hey, I'm 75 already. I think um, things should move in the other direction right now. Thank you, though. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of work to archive all of the information as well, so I can understand. Yeah, um, my head is bursting. <laughs> Um, Susan also is asking uh, or saying, um, I lived in uh, Hokkaido for a year and was amazed by the weavings of the Ainu. Um, have you seen their work? Oh, I love Ainu weaving. I have never yet been to Hokkaido, but I had some house guests here uh, last winter who insisted I come to visit them. So I think it won't be too long before I get up there. It's beautiful work. And I like the elm fiber that they used to use for their garments. And I love the shapes and how they relate to Northwest Coast um, stuff from the Americas. Um, how, what a treat to be there for a year. She's lucky. Um, Christine Brown is asking an, another uh, clarification, sort of technical question is um, just to clarify this, the spell, the spelling of Sarasoto and, and defining it. Sarasa is the word, oh. S-A-R-A-S-A. -A -A. Got it. Oh, sorry, we, and we got to that. So we, you already talked about that. Sorry about that. Um, let's see Don't here. worry, I've got that. <laughs> I think it's the, the, it's just navigating the question. So yeah, Annan, did you have a question? Yeah, I see one from Pamela Wiley. Uh, question to, for Andrea. What dyes were used in the Yuzen dyeing? Oh, so um, prior to about 1860 or 70, the dyes were natural. But when aniline was devised, in Germany, it very quickly became available in Japan. So I would say there's a variety of dyes used these days. Um, still natural dyes, especially indigo, but some more tricky and expensive dyes like Benihana, which was a beautiful orangey color have been replaced by aniline. So starting in the 1870s, chemical dyes became more popular. However, you still have 
production centers using natural dyes. There's one island off Honshu called Kihachijo, which uses a local flower to give a beautiful golden mm -hmm. yellow color. There are certain dyes and the cloth tends to be expensive. It's more time consuming to use these natural dyes. Um, let's see. Um, Jeffrey Aldridge is asking, um, when was the last time you returned to Japan? Oh, I've not been in Japan in a long time. I came back in March last year. I'd been there for two months on that trip for four months the year prior. Um, yeah, and I hope to get, go again soon. You know, I began by studying very specifically the garments in the cloth, and that was in the mid 80s. And I added and added and added to my knowledge. Nowadays, my trips to Japan tend to be more to destinations and hanging out with the craftsmen, watching the process or learning more about the locality, the life in the local setting. For example, it was only a few years ago that I started visiting locales on the Sea of Japan side. That is the part facing the rest of Asia. And I realized that the history there, that all the shipping that had gone through there with the boats stopping at the main port had put it in quite a different cultural position as far as mingling with culture and products from other countries. So it has a different kind of history and development. And I like traveling to different places, different parts of Japan. As you heard, I've been in Okinawa, not yet to Hokkaido, quite fascinated with the Sea of Japan side with these long snowy winters and the lifestyle it produced. And then we nowadays have these big art fairs. So I was there a few years ago with my whole family for a three week art fair that was planted out in the countryside in an area that was quite poor. And this takes place every three years and it brings both foreign artists and foreign visitors to the area and really supplants the economy there. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Angie Woolery. A question, what goes into preserving the integrity of these textiles as they age? Historically, they're kept folded flat on special drawers. But what's happened in the last century has been sort of a, a rocket into tradition. Women, as I think I mentioned, no longer generally wear kimono on a daily basis. They've been wearing Western clothing for a long time. So um, the humidity in Japan is kind of intense during the summer. Most Japanese keep them very neatly stored lying vertical. And um, I must say, which I didn't mention, but certainly should have, that the women owners of these kimonos have a tremendous emotional bond to them. They always took a lot of time choosing the parts of their ensemble. It wasn't just the haori, the kimono, the nagajuba, the obi to tie them all together, the accessories, the tabe socks, the type of sandal, the type of bag, they're very intimately connected with their kimono. So they're precious. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer uh, Budenhagen is asking if you have recommendations about places to donate or sell special textiles. Um, her family's been traveling and collecting for 60 years. Well, that's a treasure. Um, no, I'm not so good on that part because during most of my collecting years, well, during the early years, I made 
curated collections, which I sold as a unit to museums. So they were related pieces. And then during the years that I was based in New York with textile documents, I sold those pieces directly to designers in interiors or apparel who were looking for ideas to reuse. So I have very little experience in selling directly to collectors. But I'd love to hear back from her when she resolves this question. <laughs> Maybe it would be good for me to learn the next phase. <laughs> I know at um, Portland State, we're always, I mean, we have a, co a short costume collection that um, we maintain and um, are always sort of looking for, um, uh, you know, additions, both text additions and, and sort of artifacts to add to our teaching collection. So um, Jennifer, I'll type my name in the chat too. And I also might have some additional resources for you, so. Um, Jody Stegman is asking, how do you recommend cleaning antique Japanese textiles? One example for, or one item, for example, is a very old linen kimono that seems to have some paper st stiffening lining. Um, it's very soiled, but I'm afraid to do anything. Yeah, cleaning kimonos is um, a whole art. And in Japan, when a kimono is gonna be clean, it's totally taken apart by a professional and the lengths of cloth are washed and cleaned and ironed and it has to be reconstructed usually involving a new lining so the last time i checked to have that done uh, the cost for that was about 200 dollars per item i'm sure there are people in the states who do it as well in the case of other fibers uh, like asa or the other bast fibers, they can be washed in water, but it's tricky. I mean, if it seems to be a valuable piece, I wouldn't do it myself. My best advice. Thank you for that. Um, a conservator is the answer. Which I'm not. <laughs> Margot Hay Haygood has a question here for you, Andrea. Okay. It, I have a fascination with indigo, especially shibori and ikat. Do you know when it reached Japan? Where did it come from? India or China? Um, sorry, the beginning of the question was a fascination with the dye, indigo, right? Yes. I believe indigo is indigenous to China and Asia, and it's been used there for a long time. So um, a lot of the basis of Japanese textiles is from China. For a long time, China was supplying textiles to Japan. As Japan was building up their treasury by exporting raw silk, and then silk textiles, they also, also developed their weaving capacity and their textile production. But from the Shoso Inn from many years ago and that beautiful depository in Nara, uh, we see some very old pieces that came in through the Buddhist connections and um, I'm not too sure of the prehistory, pre-European trading, but I gather from my studies of mercantile traffic in that part of the world that it's been going on for a long time. So before the Europeans arrived, there was plenty of coming and going of textiles, including indigo. Mm -hmm. I'm doing some research now with a Japanese assistant here and we're digging deeper into uh, both the origin of some of these traditional methods, how they reached Japan and how they evolved. So I'd like to see more of this published in English, but I haven't read too much. Mm -hmm. By the way, I have a question for you. Are most of your um, 
questions coming from students or are there other people represented here in this crowd of questioners? I think there's certainly some other people represented because I don't, we don't have quite as many students as attendees that are here, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, we have one, we have uh, just maybe two final questions. Um, one that is, um, oh, and uh, people are giving, uh, letting us know where they're coming from. Please feel free to type that into the chat, into the chat. Um, um, this is my only feedback. So the more I hear, the more I know. Thank you. Oh yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. And um, uh, like one, one actually a technical question is, um, I noticed that we're recording this event. Um, will it be available um, online after viewing? Um, for students that are in the History of Dress course, yes, this uh, will absolutely be available online um, for you all. And um, I, I believe, so I'm not entirely sure. Maybe if Caleb is with us right now, he can type in a little message. Um, uh, but I believe that Portland Textile Month um, has the ability to make this available as well after this event. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll we'll hopefully get an answer on that before the end of this. Um, and then I think um, one really great sort of final question to let us. Oh yeah, Caleb says yes. It will be on the PTM website. So. <laughs> Um, and then I think a great um, question just to sort of take us home with today is from, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, Timi Cheng. Um, do you have any advice on how to connect to the Japanese creative community? Hmm. Well, I've read that now that the whole world is being isolated, uh, Japan is beefing up their internet communications. So I would say that's that's the way to go for the moment. It's like certainly inconvenient for all of us to not be able to meet in person, but the Japanese, this is Japan Design Week, I believe, or Tokyo Design Week. There are all the time events coming out of Japan, particularly on design. So for the moment, I think it's uh, via the cloud. But I can't tell you more specifically. I'm staying in touch with my friends in Japan. When they told them or invited them to join us, they said, well, you know, nice stuff, Andrea, but it's going to be 4 o'clock in the morning when you speak, so maybe <laughs> not this time. <laughs> but we have to work around. That's all we can do. I'm hoping things will ease up for all of us in this COVID world, but um, it's a little bit tricky right now. Communication, one community to the next. Thank you very much for inviting me. I Thank really you. enjoyed and hopefully next year, maybe I'll get back to Portland in person for Portland Textile Month. It's great to be in the midst of all these events. Sounds great. Thank you, Andrea. There's many thanks in the chat as well. You're very loved and very much appreciated. <laughs> so long. Take care. <laughs> Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone, so much. Stay well. And um, thank you again, Andrea, for your time today. Um, it was great. Sure. <laughs>